Hi everybody, it's Ann Patchett from Parnassus Books and I am so excited about tonight's event with my friend and fellow bookstore owner, Louise Erdrich. Uh, Louise and I are, are always talking about how blown away we were during the pandemic to have such love and support from customers from all over our cities and from all over the country. And I know that independent bookstores everywhere experienced mm, a saving amount of love from their customers. So I wanna take this opportunity to say thanks to everyone. Thank you to the stores that we're in partnership with tonight, Bookworks, Magic City Books, Odyssey Bookshop, Parnassus, of course, and Porter Square Books. And those are all stores where I have a lot of great friends. So what I want to tell you is when you buy the extra copies of the sentence, which you're going to want after you listen to this talk, be sure to buy them from your local bookstore. We love support at Parnassus and we love support for Birch Bark Books, but this is the night that you need to go to your local bookstore and buy all the extra books that Louise and I are gonna be talking about tonight. Thank you so much for tuning in and enjoy the show. Hi, Louise. Hi, and I'm so glad we're here. We're I, here. We're here. It's amazing it to is. see you. It is so great to be here. And all the things we've been through and everything that's happened since we were a supposed to be in person. Right. And I was just remembering that the last time I was supposed to see you was like day three of the pandemic. You were coming to Nashville to do an event for the Night Watchman. And you called your daughter, Palace, said, Mom, I don't think you should go. And you were very apologetic. Um, and What's and I? it turns like you were you were like <laughs> was, I'm really I don't, I'm so sorry I don't want to miss you but but it was like at that hour if 30 minutes later everyone canceled it was that day you remember that it was day? the strangest day it was the 11th I think and then the and then the end the NBA canceled its season so so you didn't have to feel bad about not coming not to Nashville. That. The MBA was just kind of making it easier for you. Yeah, I remember. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, Louise and I are great friends, but we also both published with HarperCollins. So I was in New York that day with Jonathan Burnham and Jane Byrne and the whole team. And when we left breakfast, nobody went back to the office for a year and a half. It was really? like the day. It was the it was day. The day. It all fell apart. It was the day. Yeah. Although yeah. Anne, I Anne did offer to have her husband fly me to Nashville. That I would get on. I was in Kansas. I would get on this small plane, which I thought of as a crop duster, because <laughs> that's my only reference for small planes, having been crop dusted many times as I hoed sugar beets. And I I just couldn't even imagine getting on a small plane. And then we've said this before, we could have been stuck together the whole time. And and there would have been real joy in that. And yes. And if I told Carl that he should maybe pick up some extra money by crop dusting on the weekends, <laughs> I feel certain he would be into it. He, he would. While you were being crop dusted yeah. while picking beets, Carl growing up in Meridian, Mississippi, they used to run behind the mosquito trucks so that followed we. the town and play oh blind man's yes. bluff in whatever poison they were misting into the it, streets. It was Malfion, and Malfion. we did that too. We did yes. that too. We, and, uh, it, good. Yeah. I guess that's why we're all... Uh, who we, who, who we are. are. Who we are. Who we are. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we're just doing our best. Well, we're writers and he is a phenomenal doctor. So I guess something works. And the I don't mosquitoes think are about dead. It. Yeah, let's, I don't want to think about on. it. We, we can't think about that too hard. Um, so I like to think of myself as in the upper echelons of your biggest fans. I 
love this book so much. Um, and in fact, I asked you if I could interview you today, which isn't something I normally do going around begging authors to get to talk to them. But I, I felt such a profound connection to this book as a bookseller and as somebody who was helping run a bookstore through a pandemic and and everybody in the store passed the galley around and it, we were all just mesmerized because you were speaking for us you were you were giving voice to our experience and um, making us part of history at this time as booksellers so we are I, part of history we man. are this was his this was this the, the entire book selling operations changed for everybody i think in many big ways but what really astounds me is probably how different everyone's methods are and yet that there's a commonality something's do you think that the, everybody's everybody is different because i feel like we all got out of the gate at such different times and in such different ways and we wound up at the same place again right. and again what i'm hearing what was true for us that we just thought oh well okay we're washed up amazon's going to come in they're going to fulfill all the orders we're up, closed everything. it's done and here came our customers but customers from all over the place shopping online from our store we had no idea what we were doing was your experience like that it was exactly the same we i i kept uh writing mass emails to everyone saying we're going to we're going to survive we're going to be fine and inside i thought no we're not how am i going to handle this how are we going to handle this uh we were i think we were very relieved by um we, we applied for a paycheck protection loan yeah we did too and yeah and i we saw i saw it going through i was very grateful to nancy pelosi and to everyone who voted that in because it saved us and allowed us to make the changes we needed to make we needed to make a lot of changes in order to go online to do curbside you know we had to really restructure ourselves and, and we were able to do it. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we had such a hard time with, and I've been in your store and it's tiny. It's tiny. But the whole, our whole store became our fulfillment center. It did. So it did. we didn't understand how to shove it back into the bottle so that we could let customers back into the store. Oh, that's so so you identified with that so profoundly oh oh the sort of feeling that we were uh a, a, an intensely organized set of hoarders with <laughs> boxes stacked everywhere and books everything yeah right right that's how uh, we looked and i, I, I don't I, know I, I don't know how we looked to customers but we were running our we were running doing our best and also we had to think about nobody um getting too close to anyone else we had to think about everyone's health At, in the beginning we didn't have masks we had right. we were working close together wearing you know bra cups over our faces whatever we could find right and 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 so um eventually because we have such a small bookstore we decided to have one person at a time on staff just doing everything and that became a form of haunting in the book of course the book is about a haunted a haunted bookstore but that in itself is quite a haunted thing to do to be working alone in a small bookstore so before the pandemic did you want to write a book about a haunted bookstore or I had, did the I, haunting come from the <laughs> pandemic? I had tried to write this book over and over, and I began in 2014. And I couldn't, I kept, I kept, um, so I, I would stop because I had decided it had to be about what really happened in a bookstore 
one year. It had to happen from All Souls when the, actually we're still in the time when um, the world is, the world between, the, the fabric between the worlds is thin, right? So I had to start it then because I knew it would be a haunting. So I kept trying and I kept adding bits here and there, but I didn't really start it until I made a big decision to not let up on it in November, All Souls Day, 2019. Oh my God. It would have to take in whatever happened. And what a year, what a year to choose and that you you were already going forward. I had no idea that you were writing this. So in real time, here comes the pandemic and, and here comes the murder of George Floyd in your hometown and the repercussions that spread across the country, across the world. And you were right there, but you were you were Madame Dufarge. You were knitting it into your scarf as it was happening. <laughs> oh, thank God I wasn't I wasn't pointing out who who went on the guillotine next. But I was just I was just knitting it in, but I wasn't the person I have to say who really who really uh, took care of what was happening was my daughter Palace. I was with my daughters Palace and Gage. The three of us were living together. Uh, my other daughters were close by, so we saw them. At, we saw them also during this time. But she uh, kept careful track of what was happening. I was too scattered and trying to make things work and trying to figure out if our workers were safe going to and from the store. We stayed open except for maybe a day when we. We had to had to close, but we stayed open. We stayed. We kept fulfilling people's orders. We kept working through the entire time of the uprising. But you weren't letting people in, were you? No, no. We were. We were um, per- filling. Uh, I think I said in the book somewhere that everyone who wasn't out in the streets wanted to know why everyone was out in the streets. Right. right? So right. there was there was a, and I know this happened with you. There was a this great need for people to know more about yes. the issues of racism and policing and all of the all, all of the things that were um, laid bare all of the truths that were laid bare once again as we see this happening over and over throughout american history again we we all we need to know what's happening so but you you become part of history by writing this down. Have you ever written anything so immediate? Never. Just so I, no. Absolutely present tense. And here it is published. It's not like you're publishing it a year from now. And I remember just as your friend, how many times you pulled this manuscript back. Mm-hmm to do a little more. It was done. It wasn't done. It was turned in. It came back. Came back. Because of you, not because of your editor, but you kept thinking of it in different ways and wanting to make tweaks. Were they big changes, little changes? They were huge changes. I, and it was my, my editor, Terry Carton was big, a big part of this. I, I had to change it because I had, uh, I had so many characters in it. I I didn't stick with the one haunting. I had too much I, too much started to happen in the book. I had to pull it back. So there's another book out there that I'm never going to use, but it's it's of the the the, the things that fell away, you know, the the husk of the book maybe. I don't know. Can you just give us a an elevator pitch? Give us your your plot overview so the people watching this will have an idea of what the book is about. Uh, it Are you depends good at that? On, no, you're, you're looking <laughs> at someone who's terrible at that, but it depends on which thread you pull because there's several threads going I through. I know, I know. But um, 
I'll say, uh, I'll say, I'll take the crime. Okay. The or the precious error. So it's it's an it's a huge error um, for our hero Tookie. She's a woman who has a, an unassailable need to make mistakes, mm -hmm. and she makes a huge mistake. But for love, she takes a she I, takes no she robs she be, she becomes a body snatcher she does it for someone else um, and unbeknownst to her the body is carrying something that will put her away it will give her the title the sentence she receives a sentence of 60 years so she is incarcerated and during that time she receives a dictionary she receives books she begins to read with murderous attention. She gets a job when she's out. She gets sentences commuted. She has that fortune. And she gets a job at a bookstore that is so much like Birchbark Books, you'd almost have to say it is. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> she gets a job. And it's the one job that really fits her personality. Uh, and she becomes part of this world that's what we know as the exchange and the, the joys. Um, everything about book selling becomes her joy and also her irritation and her madness, per yeah. perhaps. And... What really happens to her is that her favorite, most annoying customer dies, but will not leave the store. That's what the rest of the book is about. And there have been illusions that perhaps there is a ghost in your store. Is that true? I thought, I always thought it seemed so somewhat haunted. And now I feel I've haunted it by, by writing this book. And I think I've, I've done this for my, my, um, my co-workers at the store because I had someone come up and, and say, you know, I'm, I'm never going to walk into the store at night. Not again. I'm using a flashlight. I'm not going to reach into the bank of light switches which is behind this wall always yes always <laughs> never <too>. again yes. <laughs> no i won't reach mm -hmm. in there without a flashlight first because within the book something is already on that other side of the wall so uh, it, it may be haunted now okay uh, so many really hard things happen in this book uh, both hard for, for uh, Tuki and hard for our country. Uh, yeah. And yet it is a funny book. How? How did you walk that line? I had Tuki. I had this character who had a kind of larcenous slant on the world and somehow maybe... I think with all of our characters, Anne, there's some, there's some deep part of ourselves that is activated. And this for me, writing in Tookie's voice, was the closest, uh, well, maybe not the closest. My closest is a 13-year-old boy. But, of, <laughs> but course. of course. But Tookie was, Tookie really got me through so much of this. But she uh, she lives out a lot of a lot of the reckoning that happened in the city is lived out in this family mm -hmm. that it was already she had already married the man who arrested her so that's pretty that becomes of course during this time a huge issue mm -hmm. finally you know the the veil is torn away from so much of that they have a daughter who is very much an activist 
and she has a new baby. So there is so much going on in their little family, you know, mm -hmm. but there's also so much going on with what it means to be haunted as an indigenous person. And as one of the characters says, who is very much a historian, she's a young historian, and she talks about how in all of these books, you know, these horror books and in movies, one of the big tropes is to be haunted by unquiet Indians. And it's really this country's deep unease with the fact that the main way that Native people were confronted was through dispossession and genocide. And how do we ever admit that? And slavery, because with Black people, Native Americans were also, in many cases, enslaved. Mm -hmm. So, or enslaved people married in to tribal communities. So it, there's a there's a very big there's a very there's a wealth of commonality there. Um, but it plays out on such a personal level, right? But it's. It's the humor, it's the gentleness, and maybe it is just that you're, you're taking what's global and making it so local. But I was so struck by this book as a way to have conversations and think about things without being crushed. And yeah. you deserve to be crushed, God knows, <laughs> um, by the pain. Uh, and yet so often, and, I, and I'm saying this as a bookseller and not mm -hmm. as a writer, people come into the store and they say, I want something smart and true and funny that isn't going to destroy me. Mm -hmm. I want to learn. I want to have this experience, but I don't want to be destroyed. There's a book coming out at the end of January called Thank You, Mr. Nixon by Gish Jen, which is such a beautiful book. And it, it walks a very similar line. And I, and I just want to yeah. say as a bookseller, what a gift that is to be able to find a way to tell these stories that people can hear them. I, I, I would take everything you said and, 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 uh, and, completely agree except i don't think that to be crushed and stay crushed is what we want to do in a book or in any other way yeah i think people need to be uncrumpled by the truths of by knowing the truths of history and mm -hmm. in this time what we're doing right now we know is a, we are making a history that could crush the future future yes. in reality. So there are these books that are somehow both, um, I would say in terms of climate yes. change, I would say the, the Ministry for the Future is one. And a book that's coming out in January called A Paradise is oh. one of the most extraordinary books that I've read. I have it on my dresser. I'm going to say this again because we're taping it. Hanya Yanagahara. I hope I'm right. <laughs> it's on your dresser. And it's it's a read among reads. It's extraordinary. Um, it's fabulous. So, so uh, that, so what I was, what I forgot to end, I forgot to end that. I segued off and then I lost my train of thought. So the book is partly about being na native people being haunted by white colonialism, by white settlerism. And actually it does turn out because indigenous people, the thing that really doesn't come across so often is um, how funny people are, how really funny. Um, so it does become a matter of uh, ironies and ironies on ironies. And yes. Well, all those things that the 
the well-intentioned white people who come into the store and say to the staff, some of the funniest stuff I've ever read. I mean, it's, <laughs> it, and, I, and I kept wanting to call you saying, no, tell me this didn't happen. <laughs> tell me, tell me these are not true stories from Birch Bark Books. The, they're just a few, a few of the <laughs> questions, a few of the questions, yeah. So if, if anyone wants to name their hamster or their dog an indigenous name, uh, maybe it would be better to choose a different background for your dog, like Sparky, a perfect Sparky. dog name. Don't you yeah. think? Yeah. I think that's it. Yeah. So people would come in and say, I would like a really good Ojibwe name for my hamster. <laughs> right. Oh, for anything, anything, <laughs> any any animal, right. Yeah, Damn. no, no people, people do that, or we get, get calls. Sometimes we get great calls, and I have to say that mostly our customers are fantastic people. And we're a place, too, I think we see, it, it comes up in the book, too, where we sort of see ourselves as being a place where people can bring those questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the staff is, the people who are working at the store are, by and large, pretty prepared to answer those questions with, with grace. That's a beautiful, a beautiful thing. Um, let's go back to the beginning of the book for a minute, because this is another question I really wanted to ask you. So in the be the beginning of the book, the first section is about right. the crime. There are a the crime. lot the crime. There, the crime. Mm, there are a <laughs> lot of ways. There are a lot of ways to land a character in jail. Tons of them. There are so e many. So many to choose from. Just all day long, you could pick. <laughs> you um, could. I didn't see this one coming. No. And I just You've never wondered. Thought about no, no. And you know, I'm the I'm the daughter of a police officer. Yes, you uh, are. I've, you I've spent a lot of time you know a lot. thinking. I've been thinking about interesting crime most of my life. Um, and this yes. was so out of left field. And I understand the whole uh, it's a very fuzzy crime. There are a lot of fuzzy crimes available to us as well. Where <laughs> In God's name, did this come from? I, I think that's the the problem is having a way to answer that, isn't it? That when you are writing and something happens, that you don't know why. For instance, I think it came out of this first line that came into my head, and I really couldn't refuse it because it was so direct. In, while in prison, I received a dictionary. And I. Yeah, that's a beautiful I was, one. Yeah, that's but beautiful. I didn't. I love that. But, but I didn't really want it because then I had to, of course, get the character a, to prison. Get the character to prison. And so, but somehow, because she went on <clears throat> to describe herself, I knew the crime she would do. And I knew, I didn't know how it would merit a sentence of 60 years, but it became apparent that it had to do with something, something much more serious had to happen. I couldn't find a very long sentence for body snatching. I think it's regarded as practically. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like take care of it, you know, mm -hmm. what, what, yeah. Well, um, the book opens with a great velocity and it keeps it up as circumstances change and change. There, there are just a couple of things that I really want to ask you about. Um, I love the character of Pollux. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Yes. Pollux. Yeah, yes. Absolutely my heart. And one of the things that you do better than anyone writing by a long shot is you write about um, happy, long-term, realistic love. 
I don't think anyone else comes close on that. Couples who have uh, really who have no really no really <laughs> think really? about it. Couples who have yeah, been together so. for a very long time and they have a true and deep and complicated relationship. It's not just straight up happiness, but that sort of deep grown up love mm -hmm. that Tookie and Pollock share is so moving to me because I don't see it anywhere else because I feel like I have that in my life right. uh, and, and I never see it reflected. Uh, and I see it again and again in your books. It's not like everybody is happily in love. No, uh, they're complicated, very like complicated. The, the same was true with the Night Watchman and the relationship he had with his wife. And I could go backwards in the roundhouse in La Rose, you know, these, these deep I never loving of that. I... marriages mm -hmm. of people who they get angry with one another, they're hurt, they're disappointed, but they have each other's back. And it's, I mean, Louise, let me tell you, it's your theme. It's your thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, have to, I have to thank my parents. They have been to, they were together 67 years. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they uh, they had that they had each other's back they had that I, it's in in a complicated way always but yeah. they, that's how it is it's not as though you know it's the course of true love it it is not a smooth ride no but it's true it's love yeah, yeah. and 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 Tuki, she hangs on to um, a lot of her baggage about the fact that Pollux arrested her all these years later. She's still really hurt about it, but right. she, but it, it also doesn't impair their love. They are still together. I, you know, you're not reading this story and thinking, oh my gosh, I wonder if they're going to break up. They're not going to break up, but they're going to feel these complicated feelings all the same. That's really hard. That's really hard. And a lot of, a lot of their love is, is, um, shown by food mm -hmm. he, he's always making something for her that i mean i wanted to eat <laughs> and, and 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 by i don't know they have a lot of their conversations yeah and by by what they what they uh, their walks that they take things that they do the, the dive bars they go to or whatever you know the yeah. the crummy crummy um the crummy the, the things that happen the worst thing she does is she throws away a ham sandwich that he made for her yeah. and you know i i um while i was writing it i think it was in copy editing my editor said you know they, that's a really upsetting thing that happens but i don't see why throwing away a ham sandwich would be so bad <laughs> And I, so I had to explain a little bit in, in the um, text. They both grew up hungry. Yeah. They never, ever. One thing they never ever do, is waste food made with love. They never waste food, but food made with love, is something that they always share, and they never, just treat it like trash. That actually so, makes that makes me want to cry. <laughs> I find that so moving. I really do. Like I'm turning pink. I can see my face. Um, the other thing is, it is a novel full of daughters, as your world is full of daughters, none of whom, none of whom biologically belong to the people they claim as parents. There's mm. Flora's daughter, there's Pollux's daughter, neither one of them an actual daughter, but then there are all the daughters of the bookstore. Oh mm -hmm. my God, Louise, can we talk about, can we talk about yeah. all the daughters we have yeah. at the bookstore, all of our bookstore oh, yeah. girls who we bring clothes to and food to and yeah. love. And yeah. I feel like 10 years ago, I got a store full of daughters. Um, yes. And so nobody has a biological daughter. And, and in a way, it makes 
little, is it, is Travis the baby? Is that right? Or Jarvis? Uh, Jarvis. 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 Travis or Jarvis? Jarvis the baby. Like the biological baby, which brings this huge force of love and just his babiness brings the huge force of love. But talk about all those daughters. Well, some place I came across um, this idea of, of the, I, I didn't do this by design, but the fact is in indigenous families, you have this, you have this large, um, enlarged sense of who is family. And I think you do too. I mean, yeah. reading, um, I'm, I'm going to do this to you, Anne. I don't care. <laughs> Because everybody's going to be like, wait, wait, that's not on the shelf. What is that? It's not out, folks. It's not out. <laughs> well, when, when you read this book, which is superlative, it's and it, it kept me up most of the night last night again because I've already read it, and I. But in this, so this really is. I I think that it's exactly what you're talking about when you talk about how your house is this place where people come and they live and they, yeah. and you have these, they're not really guests. You make family out of your people and you have this, um, this enlarged sense of family. And for, for whatever reason, you have that same, that same um, context for what family means. That doesn't have to be biological at all. Did you set out though to say, I'm gonna pick these young women, these young, the, all the young women are just so amazing, but not make them biological daughters or did it just happen that way? No, I didn't think of it until you you said so. Oh, just that's funny. Now. Right, no, I didn't. Um, but but they, um, they were so much fun to write. Yeah. <laughs> as you would have the same yeah. fun, I'm sure, if you were writing people from your from the store. But they're so they're not. I should say it very strongly. They're not based on people from no. the store. Of I was really so. careful not to do that. <laughs> but at the store, I do have that sense of uh, privilege because I'm allowed to have um, young women and young men working in the store who are. Who are who become like family, mm -hmm. and who I I lean on for all sorts of knowledge, and for I trust them with everything that goes on with the store, and and many other things besides. Uh, there's just one little subplot that I want to mention because I found it so moving that Hedda, who is Pollux's niece, but really his daughter of right. heart, heart and soul, his daughter. And she does not like Tookie, who is right. not her stepmother, but certainly is functioning as her stepmother. Yeah. And there's a lot of conflict there. And it turns out that she has been in a, a porn shoot of Midnight, <laughs> Midnight Cowgirl. And then her soul is ultimately restored at the end when Tookie lets her take her jingle dress. Am I just reading too much into this? The idea of her, the vulnerability of her being naked and sexual mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. outside the fold of the family. Yeah. And then, and then when, when she says, you know, this isn't the kind of jingle dress that you, that people have now with sequins and, you know, it's sort of sexy. This is like a full coverage. This is the, this is the Amish jingle right. dress. Right. It's, it's, it's a black, it, it's, it's, it's the old time jingle dress. No, you're absolutely right. And that moment is a moment of you become a sacred being when you mm. put that dress yeah. on, you become sacred. This yeah. is. This is covering you with, with the holy wish to heal others because that's what the sound is going to do. And they go into George Floyd Square and they dance. Um, and it's a healing. It's a, it, it's a time of healing. Um, for, for both the dancer and the observer. Yes. 
and the, the the thing that happens is that so if you go online and you the sound of a jingle dress type in and then you hear that that motion it's it's a very it is so distinctive and when you're in the presence of those sound it's it's a soundscape that um, is meant to come into your pre, in your being that's meant to restore you and so that's what happens people are restored when they are they are part of they're part of it they can't stay observers they become imbued with that sound and that healing the healing properties of that sound is it okay to say it's a kind of baptism i think it i think that would be okay you know i it also there's a story that goes with the dress that became so important uh, my my friend brenda child talked about this as being an important story for the pandemic the story originated in during the um, flu of 1918 mm -hmm. a grandfather's granddaughter fell desperately ill and he had a dream and his dream was that women wearing these dresses that made these sounds and that were decorated with tin cones came out of each direction and so when he woke up he asked women in the family to make these dresses and to wear them around the girl and she grew up she was she was restored to health she grew up and these dresses they became more and more a part of um, Ojibwe culture and then indigenous culture and powwow culture so they're all over now and during the pandemic these healings really happened quite often and that did happen in George Floyd Square and it was something that still people are called out jingle dressers are called out to their they call out the jingle dressers when there needs to be a healing so often mm. so that's what happens she is you're absolutely right she becomes in that dress she becomes a healer which is very different than her than being a porn star yeah. yeah yeah which didn't happen anyway it it right thank god you know she's right. yeah but she's so restored it's there's so much forgiveness that's it that's what it is it's a book about forgiveness and healing on it is. All, all the different directions and i sort of resist that i'm such a grudger personally i'm like tookie a no, grudger you are, you are not you <laughs> i are find not. it very difficult i find it difficult so um so it but it is and by the end i think that's i think i think it's important that people come to a sense of acceptance if forgiveness that was see that's generous of you to say that is forgiveness uh I guess come to it through the complications, you know, through the through the gates, which are many, and you know, you might you might get hung up on a lot of them. There are fences upon fences that you have to negotiate your way through. Well, to look at it as the forgiveness that Tuki shows Pollux. I know it's it's love it's i i don't forget it does stay with me but i am still here and i'm still loving you and that is the kind of forgiveness that just resonates in every circle of the story i see what you did i'll never forget it but we we are together but you're together. still you're still in minneapolis you know it's still yeah. your city the yeah. incredible pain, but you're still there. Yeah, yeah. And okay. that's how it comes out for them. Yeah. But, yeah. Okay, so this is the last thing I want to talk about. The way I communicate with other people is by yeah. giving them books. And if somebody comes into my house, 
I'm pulling things off the shelf and handing them, you know, take this, take this, take this. Right. Uh, if, if a friend comes into the store or someone I don't know, you know, it's either I am selling them a book, but a lot of times I'm frankly just giving them the books. Uh, I, oh, you've got to read this. You've got to look at this. Right. And people will say to me, oh, no, I can't take all of these books. And I say, but this is how I communicate. Mm -hmm. I communicate by giving people books. This is a book about people who communicate by giving each other books. This <laughs> is, is a book about it a is. ghost who is trying to communicate. I had such a great time calling Lily King and saying, <laughs> really? The ghost keeps throwing euphoria on the floor. <laughs> she was so excited. Really? <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> um, but again and again, the layers of communication that come through this story because the booksellers are giving the people like food, the books they need. And then at the end, you just give us long lists of books. Thank you. I was very flattered, honored to be there in the back of your book. Uh, but there were, there's a, a moment where you're like, these are great, super short novels. And I think how many times have I made a list of great, super short novels for people? Right. Right. That's a, that's how my brain that's works. How my, yes. And one of them that you gave to me, the all of it, mm. is on that list. It's on there. But, right. but the one that, uh, the blue flower. Uh, the blue flower. So I have a oh question God. to you. Mm -hmm. Do you have, so this, there's a character in the book, Tookie's other very favorite character, favorite customer, who uh, she calls dissat dissatisfaction. Oh God! Yes. Do you have a dissatisfaction? Do you have a character? <laughs> I everyone in a who's in a bookstore, yeah, uh, who has a bookstore or who works in one, has a character who's read everything. Yes. It's yes. It's, it's a, yeah. It's like playing stump the band, right? You remember that show? So, right. um, a, probably two weeks ago. A young woman, a sophomore undergraduate from Vanderbilt, Debbie Wang, came over to interview me for the Vanderbilt School newspaper. And at the end, I said, I really want to give you some books. So smart, such a great girl. Right. And we're going around the store and I'm saying, OK, have you read? Oh, yeah, I read that last week. Have you read? <laughs> oh, I read that a month ago. She was 19 years old. I, I, I mean, I finally yeah. came up with something but she just broke me. She had read everything, <laughs> fiction, nonfiction, science, and she was so unassuming. And, and I could tell she felt sorry for me too. She was like, mm, yeah, that one too, sorry. Yeah. And I finally just said, I don't care if you wanna work one night a month, if you wanna work two hours on every second Saturday, please, come and work at the store because oh, that's yes. what you have to do with those people. You have to hire them. Oh, I, that's how staff comes to the store. I talk to people about books and I have a young person starts telling me what they're reading. Um, and I ask if they want a job. That's yeah. how you, that's how, you know, you yeah. know, immediately. Yeah. yeah. And, and especially when they read the books you don't read. Oh, always. <laughs> yeah. Of course, right. Yeah. Yeah. So anyone who's out there who is a dissatisfaction. Well, I bet there's a lot of people who are looking at this or listening to it who are of that sort, who read everything. Because why else would you be watching? You read everything. You, you go to any length to find a book that has that certain quality that you love in a book. I don't know if it's going to keep you up. How, so what is the what, what book recently? Not this one, but Anne, what, what book was that for you that kept you, that fulfilled um. all of that? There have, this has been a really good fall. Colson White, Colson Whitehead's Harlem Shuffle. Oh yeah. Elizabeth Strout's Oh William. Um, Lily King's 
five Tuesdays in winter. Uh, I, a book that I just read the other day that came out in 2006, and this is the great part of having a bookstore, because everything is new if it's new to you. Um, the Sound of a Wild Snail Eating? Yes, I read that. It's like a cult what? classic. It's just it a book a, about yeah. a snail. Um, <laughs> I, I thought, and, I mean, but it's I, about, about everything. It's about yeah. everything. And it was the perfect pandemic book. It's about living in a, in a tiny world and paying attention to the world that you have. I found it so beautiful. And instantly I bought five copies, ordered five copies, bought five copies, sent them out to people. The Beatrice Prophecies by oh. Kate DiCamello, which is one of those things. It's like, Oh, this is the day that Charlotte's Web was published. I talked to Kate right before it came out and she said, oh, I'm so nervous. You know, what's going to happen? And I said, it doesn't make any difference. It doesn't make any difference at all what happens on pub day or the first month or the first year, because for generations after we're dead, people are going to be reading the Beatrice prophecies forever and ever. Yes. God. Yes. Um, uh, David Hockney's catalog called, called what? Uh, Springtime in Normandy. And oh. it's his, the, the catalog from his show at the Royal Academy in London. He's 84 years old. He did all of these paintings of springtime in Normandy on his iPad. They, <laughs> and they, they look like Grandma Moses paintings. Yeah. They are so spectacular. And that's another thing. You're never going to find that book unless you're walking through a bookstore and you see it and you pick it up and it's what speaks to your soul. So what about you? Well, I'll just, okay. I, I just want to say that's another thought that uh, I just want to go with that for a minute because yeah. we're, we're, we're so algorithm driven and we're starting to understand what, how that limits us, right? Mm -hmm. And that's one thing about bookstores. The idea that you, and it's the same with dictionaries. Mm -hmm. With a real dictionary, physical dictionary, you're going to run into words, you'll be writing a list of words down while you look up the word you're wondering about. That's right. And it's old school, just the way, you know, independent bookstores are. And that's where part of our Part of what we are, are we're hunter-gatherers, right? We're people who, who, part of our creativity comes from accidentally finding things and experimenting with what we find. And that's why I think bookstores are coming back. And yeah. that's why, and now I do have something to share. I had it right here. It is this book. Oh. So okay. Is, Good. Do you know I, I the know artist Ai Weiwei? So this is a book. Um, it's about his relationship with his father. He's Chinese, Chinese artist, extraordinary, world known now artist. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's about his beginnings. It's about Chinese history, his father, and his persecution during um, the Great Leap Forward, and his um, his his poems so his father's poems that he's memorized he memorizes they have to memorize their poems um their life their life in exile within china it's about uh his incarceration and the 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 beauty of his his, his character who he is as a person is that he um, becomes very close to his captors to the young men who are keeping him prisoner. He learns everything he can about them. And it's about his eventual um, exile, I believe to Germany, but he's been all over the world. And th his art is, is about the, the true meaning of freedom and the true meaning of expression and the true meaning of what it is to be a, a human being with that in escapable need to express or perish. There's one more. And this is in 
All right, this one surprised me because it's been in the bookstore forever and I never picked it up, right? Right next to the snail book. Right next to the <laughs> snail book. And this is about this this woman. There you go. Right. She she interviews Inuit elders and she start starts in 2008. And they are still talking about what happened in 1576 when the Frobisher expedition came through looking for the Northwest Passage. So this oral history has been passed from family to family. To, the stories have been passed verbatim for all these many, many centuries and years and generations. And so she learns what it was like for Inuit people to encounter the explorers, the, the white explorers, and what they thought, what they thought when they encountered them, and what happened. And so each of their stories then syncs up with the accounts that were written down by the white, ex the very explorers that they're talking about. It's, a, it's totally fascinating. It's incredible. And learning about the Northwest Passage right now is, um, well, it's extraordinary to think of it now. Um, and another book that I don't have right here to show you is called A Thousand Trails Home. It's by Seth Kantner. I hope everyone buys it and reads it. He was raised um, in the bush in Alaska and has all that knowledge. Just all, he, li he lived with only, um, he lived in a hunting gathering family out in the bush. And that's how he grew up. And he kept all that knowledge. And he, so he is, and he lived with Inuit people. And he, um, he decided to only hunt when he really needs something and to photograph. So this a book of photographs, but also an extraordinary, often melancholy, but also extremely joyous look at what's happening to the top tier of Alaska. And it's all seen through the lives of migrating caribou. But it's, it's wow. really unbelievable. Wow. I know. What a year for what a year for what a year. Right. And another another one I want to put on Asali yeah. Asali Solomon's Days of Africat. And oh, that could go I on your very short novel list because it's about two hundred pages. Days of Africat. Days of Africat. So good. And it's gotten great reviews. It doesn't have a great cover, and I'm afraid that it's going to vanish. So everybody, Days of Africat. Oh my God, Solomon. and we have to go or we could get into covers. Oh, but you know what? We can't because we've been talking for like three weeks. I know. But your I covers know. are done by your brilliant, beautiful daughter, Aza. And Just, yours? I mean, oh, yeah. Sookie. Well, Sookie. So uh, the, now, the brilliant secret, Aza does them. Aza the does secret them. of great covers, have them done by someone who loves you. That's so beautiful. It's so true. Yeah. You, know, you love, you love them. Yeah. Yeah. Someone you love who loves you. That's what you, that's, that's who secret. you want. That's, that's who you secret. want. Yeah. Um, so you're one of my favorite friends, favorite writers, favorite booksellers. This has just been and you. a and total you, and. joy, a total joy. Um, I, I believe this book will go on to great things. Hey, congratulations again on that Pulitzer and uh, all sorts of love and luck and great things to you. And to all of you watching and oh, all yes. of you bookstores. Oh, yes. Stores, thank you for tuning in. Everybody thank you tuned in. so much. Thank you. It's been a joy. Thank you so much. It okay. has. All right. All right. See you soon, darling. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.